Well, hello, JZP. How are you doing today? Good, man. Great to talk with you, Tom. Yeah, great to be with you as well. Thank you for being on the show. Really appreciate it. So I yeah, think maybe we'll just, yeah, we'll just jump right in. I think, one, I was reading uh, a little bit about you, and uh, it seems like your start happened at Universal Studios as a tour guide. Did I read that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I I, uh, I started over there as a tour guide. I was, re- I was actually uh, going to junior college, and I was waiting tables at night. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I heard this thing come on the radio that said, uh, you know, we need uh, help for the holidays mm-hmm. at Universal Studios. And yeah. uh, very interested in getting into the business. And I thought, well, it's something. Yeah. Did I go to Universal and maybe I could, you know, sell panda bears or <laughs> make, uh, make hamburgers or something like sure. that? <laughs> and at least I'd be on the lot or at least I'd be close to it. Right. And, and when I got there, um, person pulled me aside and said are you here for the tour guide interview and I went tour guide interview yeah yeah that, I'm here for the tour guide interview. <laughs> and, and they sent me down this thing and I ended up in this room of about 300 people oh my goodness and uh they told us the first part of the process they were going to do interviews and then uh, if you made it through that then they would cut you down to 50 and 50 would you know get a two-week training course and mm-hmm paid which was nice yeah and, uh, and at the end they would take between five and ten people and make them tour guides yeah okay why not so uh i sat down and did the interview um at the end of the day they said okay uh, we're going to ask people to stand up everybody that stands up please want to call your name stand up and <laughs> so uh they're calling all these names they don't call mine but i see a room full of people all standing up and they say okay well thanks for coming we've you know enjoyed meeting you but uh yeah cut so there's like, you know, the rest of us looking at each other in the room going, oh, I guess we're here. You know? <laughs> and, uh, so then I did two, work, two weeks during the tour training, and that was really fun and intense. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and at the end, they chose me as one of the tour guides. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Wow, this is cool. <laughs> uh, and what was great back then, this was in the late 80s, what was great mm-hmm. back then was uh, your tour guide uniform functioned as an all-access pass. To oh. anything you wanted to do anywhere on the lot. So, oh, wow. uh, so on my days off, I throw on my tour guide uniform. I come to Universal and uh, I walk around the lower lot and watch people film and go on TV <sighs> sets and movie sets and go into production offices and hand wow. out my fairly padded resume. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and that's how I got my job at Universal. I started <laughs> on the lower lot working as called a PA, which is a production assistant, the lowliest of the low, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but it was great. It was, yeah. it was the opportunity I needed. Yeah. Yeah. Foot in the door, right? Yep. You're exactly That's all it right. takes. <laughs> I love that. So then how did that turn into a visual effects producer? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot in between that, but to go from tour guide to that, I, that's gotta be an interesting story. Yeah. So, uh, after being a tour guide, I finally got a job in the lower lot and I was okay. working on the lower lot and I was, uh, started as, a PA, as I said, and then mm-hmm. I became an assistant production coordinator uh, in uh, television shows and, and movies as well. Um, mm-hmm. Production coordinator is the person that basically makes sure everything happens. So mm-hmm. the producers make decisions uh-huh. and then the production coordinator makes sure that the producer's decisions happen. Yeah. And so when the producer says, hey, you know, we're going to go on this set or we're going to go, you know, uh, we got to shoot next week that's going to take place on a on a forest set. Mm. You can make sure that you've let everybody in those departments know, okay, we're building a forest set, right? And okay. Done and you handle coordinating, getting stuff from all the suppliers and everything else. Um, and so I ended up doing that. And then I was, you know, basically running as a production coordinator for a number of years at Universal uh, on a couple of different shows for different production companies. Uh, and then I started producing uh, uh, post-production, mm. so editing, sound mixing, voice recording, that sort of thing. And um, and while I was doing that, uh, the last show that I was working on was going to move to another lot. Mm. And so I was about three months in between projects. And a friend of mine called and said, hey, there's this visual effects company that really needs help. They know how to, right. they don't know how to put a schedule together. They don't know how to budget. They're, <laughs> they're getting all this work and they're falling behind. Right. They'll pay you stupid amounts of money. Uh, would you just come over and basically produce for them for a few months? So I'd get them on their feet. Mm-hmm. And 
I thought, yeah, I've got the time. Why not? You know, I like money. So, yeah. uh, so I went and did it and I ended up staying there two and a half years. <laughs> uh, and while we were there, uh, while I was there, we started producing visual effects okay. for uh, video games. Mm -hmm. in the early days of Sega CD, there was yeah. a company called Digital Pictures. Um, mm -hmm. And they produced a lot of live action sort of early, you kind of call them interactive movies as well as games. Mm -hmm. But uh, Sega was really into it. And so mm -hmm. I was producing a lot of the visual effects for that for that company. Um, and, uh, and that was my connection into the video game space. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah. a lot of those, I think, techniques of storytelling in video games is even more popular today. And uh, it sounds like you were at the forefront of that. I mean, I was just playing a, a Batman game the other day. And I mean, half the game is you're you're watching a movie take place. And then all of a sudden you're thrown into an environment where you actually get to play for a little bit until the next piece of the movie starts. So it sounds like maybe uh, you were at the beginning of that. Yeah, I was doing a lot of stuff, a lot of experimental stuff. Uh, yeah. The first game that I actually created myself was a game called Tomcat Alley, which ended mm -hmm. up doing really well for Sega. Mm -hmm. One of the top sellers for the Sega CD. And then it actually was a huge hit in Japan where they ported it to Laserdisc. Oh, okay. They play it in arcades in Japan. Mm -hmm. Huge hit. Um, and so after that, um, I started getting attention, you know, like, hey, mm -hmm. can you design and write stuff for us? And yeah. And uh so that's when my path journey sort of shifted from traditional media into the game space. And yeah. uh, it took me probably about three or four games to really understand the differences in the medium mm. uh, and really start to get up to speed. But yeah, I was doing a lot of stuff early on that nobody else was doing just because I came from a, a different background and I sure. wanted to do games that were very cinematic in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh <clears throat> I ended up doing this glorious failure called Johnny Mnemonic, which was tied to uh, the film Johnny Mnemonic with Keanu Reeves. Mm -hmm. But we did a lot of really interesting things in there that no one had done before. And when when people look at sort of the this next generation of things people are doing now with uh, interactive storytelling or Netflix is doing a show that you can kind of choose your own path and that yeah. sort of uh, I'm kind of like smiling because I'm like, yeah, I did that 25 years ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, but yeah, it was kind of figuring it out as you go along. Uh, yeah. And, you know, kind of the, the Wild West days of the inter of the uh, interactive slash game business, which is mm -hmm. uh, long since disappeared. But yeah, that's not all I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it turned into quite the career road. You did um, kind of that type of a role for about 20 plus years then, right? You've been doing it? Yeah, yeah, about, uh, gosh, closing in on 30, actually. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was very fortunate. I've worked with a lot of uh, very famous people on a lot of big, huge game franchises. Um, and, you know, it was fun to wrangle some of those. Um, and then, you know, and then after doing a lot of sort of like traditional video game stuff, like, uh, like currently I do Jurassic World. So mm -hmm doing a lot of traditional video game stuff before that I, I kind of branched out into doing apps and, and wow. having an opportunity to be one of the original people at Niantic, a company that created both Ingress, but more famously Pokemon Go. Oh yeah. And, uh, so I got to be part of that process and got to really see the world fundamentally change again. Yeah. And that was uh, an amazing uh, experience. Yeah. I mean, Pokemon Go was I mean, all the rage. I mean, you, you couldn't even listen to the news without hearing some story of someone walking yeah. through a window or doing something because they're looking well, at it. Well, it was a perfect, it was a perfect uh, coming together of a yeah. number of things. It mm -hmm. was uh, technology, mm -hmm. including uh, augmented reality, which was just kind of, it wasn't in, it was, I wouldn't say it was in an infancy, but it was not really in, in a space where it was known to the masses as well as it is today. Yeah. Uh, and you had uh, you had a really rough uh, 2016 happening with the election and yeah. people were kind of like really on each other and it was mm -hmm. almost civil war happening. Right. And sure. you had um, and you, you also had uh, a perfect uh, property in Pokemon. Mm -hmm. uh, Pokemon is one of those evergreen properties that's multi-generational, mm -hmm. like a Star Wars or now like a Harry Potter. Yeah. Uh, the kids yeah. who grew up with Harry Potter are now parents of their own and they're yeah. 
Harry Potter fandom is now transferring to their children. Yeah. Same thing happened with Star Wars, you know, except now the, the Star Wars fans are grandparents that passed yeah. it on to their children and passed it <laughs> That's on. That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you have and you have things like uh, Pokemon, where mm -hmm. even if the grandparents didn't know or understand Pokemon, they bought the Pokemon cards and they bought the Pokemon toys for their kids who are buying it for their kids. Yeah. So it's, it's a multi-generational franchise. Right. And yeah. so it was kind of a perfect coming together of all of those uh, at, a, at a time when people were looking for a different experience. And we had been experimenting with, uh, with a location-based uh, app entertainment mm -hmm. uh, with Ingress for about four years and uh and built a lot of what became pokemon go on the back of ingress okay. so when it came out it was just kind of like people wanted something to do you could get out you could go yeah. explore the property's perfect because you got to catch them so yeah. you got to go out in the world and catch your pokemon it was like the perfect property mm -hmm. the perfect engine the perfect time yeah. uh yeah and it just turned into this kind of phenomenon we hadn't seen in a long long time um, yeah that was crazy. Yeah. I mean, it was a, a major yeah, craze, exactly. major craze. I went to, I went to the Santa Monica Pier, sort of at the height, like mm -hmm. in the month of 2016. I want to say I went in, in August of 2016 to the Santa Monica Pier, and uh, there must have been 5,000 people on the pier, all playing Pokemon, all playing Pokemon Go. And That's going to be a pretty good feeling, though, right? To walk up and see yeah, that. Yeah, it was people. kind of crazy. It was, an, it was an amazing experience, and. Yeah. Uh, and uh, somebody there actually recognized me from Ingress. Oh, wow. and, and basically, basically ID'd me as a Niantic person. And suddenly I found myself swarmed by about 300 people. <laughs> it was a really fun and interesting time. But, um, uh, but you know, it was, a, it, it was one of those things that you just don't know. Yeah. We expected it to do well. We expected mm -hmm. it to be in the top 10 or top 20 of apps. We didn't expect it to become the phenomenon it became. Um, yeah, yeah. By the time, and even to this day, Niantic still does really well with it. Um, but at the at the peak and height of what was going on with Pokemon, uh, the engineers calculated that we were processing over two hundred and fifty thousand Pokeballs a second. Oh wow! Think about think That's about the crazy. over the course of a minute, and then add that by an hour, and then add that by a day. That's insane. And you get into billions. You know, yeah. Yeah insane yeah that the, that amount of interactivity was happening so yeah, yeah. It, was, it was really cool to be a part of that yeah no it sounds like it so where did this uh this passion for writing begin did it happen um after you started to uh, create all these video games or have you always had a passion for writing stories and that's what really helped drive your success in the video gaming area you know that's a really great question because i never envisioned myself as a writer as i was growing up it wasn't mm -hmm. something that was on my radar yeah. Uh, my father was a really good storyteller. Okay. I wouldn't say he was a great writer because I never saw a lot of his writings. Yeah. Uh, but he was an amazing storyteller. He could yeah. engage anybody. He could take over a room with a story. Oh. And um, and I think I got a little of that from him. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I realized when I was working at Universal is I started to internalize a lot of the scripting process. Just because as a production coordinator back then, we delivered everything physically. Mm. So today, everything goes out electronically. Right. <laughs> back then, I would have to get to the studio at 5.30 in the morning and fire up this Xerox machine that was the size of a room <laughs> and print out 200 scripts a day. Right, yeah. Right? And yeah. then bind all those scripts and then <laughs> mark all the scripts up so that all the department heads knew what was coming. Yeah. And after all the scripts got delivered to the executives all around the <laughs> lot. And everybody got their script. And yeah. And then we had to send PAs out to deliver all the scripts to the actors. Yeah. So anyway, I was doing that five days a week for six years. Yeah. So And so while I was doing that, I would have to read all these scripts. So I literally read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scripts. Mm. And as I started to read them, I started to kind of internalize the structure and the sense and the pacing and how things worked. And mm -hmm. when a script was good and when a script was not so great. Right. And so... Um, so what I did was I, I went to one of the producers of the show that I was working on. I said, you know what? I think I might be able to write one of these. And, and he said, really? Yeah. He said, okay, well, prove it. And I said, okay, what do, you, what do I need to do? And he goes, write me a spec. And a spec is basically a script that you write based on a known property. So like if okay. you're writing a spec today, you might want to write one based on, I don't know, uh, 
you know, uh, Lopez versus Lopez or mm -hmm. a show that's currently on the, on the air. And, and mm -hmm. that or you might write something like the Umbrella Academy, but you yeah. write something that would be something that people know. Yeah. And then uh, that way, when they read it, they can go, does this person understand the characters? Do they understand the, the pacing of how they do their stories? You know, mm -hmm. is it because it's really hard to read something original and understand what you're reading compared mm -hmm. to something else. Right. Right. Uh, and so I ended up writing at the time uh, Seinfeld was really big. So I ended up writing a spec Seinfeld uh, mm -hmm. episode called The Zippo, which was about uh, George and Jerry go to uh, New Jersey because uh, Jerry's performing at one of the casinos in New Jersey. And George is always bored with Jerry's performances because he's seen him a hundred times. He wants <laughs> so he goes and sits in the bar. And as he's sitting in the bar, uh, this was back when you could smoke in bars. Yeah. Uh, beautiful woman sits down alongside of him and she kind of holds out a cigarette, like who's going to light the cigarette for me? And of course, George doesn't smoke, but he sees there's a Zippo lighter sitting on the bar. So he grabs um, the Zippo and he lights her cigarette. Well, before he can get the Zippo back down, this, you know, big mafia type guy sits down at the seat next to him and goes, hey, who, who stole my Zippo? Who possibly <laughs> have the guts to steal my Zippo? And it turns into this whole adventure of them trying to get the Zippo back. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I, I wrote it over a few days. I wrote yeah. it over uh, and I was very proud of it. I brought it and I dropped it off in his desk. And I said, uh, you know, here it is. And he went, OK, you know, I'll read it and I'll get back to you. I don't know what that meant, but OK. So I, I'm back and I'm doing my work. And at lunch, the phone rings, my, my office phone rings. Hey, John, come down to my office. OK, so uh, I go down to his office and he sits me down. He goes, you want the good news or the bad news? <laughs> and I went, OK, well. You know, give me the bad news first so I can go back and keep doing my job, right? And he goes, you're fired. Oh. And I went, That's pretty bad news. <laughs> I went, what? <laughs> Tell me what the good news is. And he says, yeah. I'm going back because we're right around the show. Oh, wow. How cool is and that? And so that was, my, that was my introduction into writing. You know, yeah. and it was a combination of, of having an innate skill. Mm -hmm. Like I said, my dad, was a, my dad was a good storyteller. And so I, know I, I yeah. knew I could tell stories. Uh, and then spending a lot of time just processing scripts and understanding how they work and figuring out what was good and what was not so good about uh, yeah. the and screenwriting. Ended uh, up being quite the classroom for you then. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. But totally, uh, you know, people can go to school nowadays and they can they could do it then, you know, go to film school. But today you can actually go to video game school. Yeah. Back then, um, none of that existed. And so uh, you could go to film school and learn how to do it. But I... I didn't have the money or the grades to do it. Sure. Yeah. But uh, but I was able to uh, kind of get real world on the job training over the six years I was working below the line at Universal. Oh, that's and, awesome. Yeah, there was no better school in the world because oh, I sure. interact directly with the producers and oh, yeah. interact directly with the actors and and crew. Yeah. And so I could I could get real time feedback from people who are actually earning a living doing it. Right. Um, right. And uh, so I learned so much. Yeah. And that's, you know, that was my, that was my break in, into writing. And uh, I wouldn't even I, think some of the politics that kind of goes on behind the scenes too, would be pretty important to, to live, right? Not in a negative way, but I mean, there's always like, you got to know how to say oh, yeah. this person, right? There, there's got to be a lot of that, that you gain that you would never get in a school environment, but in a real Correct. life environment like that, I mean, man. Yeah. You understand how, you understand how creatives work with other creatives. Yep. You understand it's about the work. It's not about you. Yeah. Uh, some people are very difficult to work with. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, there's not so much. Others are very collaborative and friendly, but you, you run the gamut just like in any situation. Sure. Uh, yeah. But when people are making, you know, a lot of money, uh, but also having to put themselves out there week to week and yeah. walk a high wire act, yeah. uh, you know, uh, emotions can run high. Sure. And so you have, to, you have to learn how to deal with that. You have to learn how to know when to back off or when to push. Yep. Um, those are kind of things that that you really only gain with experience. And, yeah. uh, you know, the the uh, the the fantasy of working in the business, mm -hmm. and the reality of working in the business are two <laughs> radically different things. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you you get a chance to learn all of that and, yeah. and learn how to navigate the minefields that you often find yourself standing in the middle of. Um and so, yeah, that's been very helpful to me. Um, yeah. I also found that I really had a passion for writing. I had a passion for creating. I had a passion for doing the job. And yeah. so 
uh, and I was good at it. I yeah. can do it. And yeah. so that, that, you know, that set me on a, on a road and a journey that I've been on, as I said, for 30 years now. That's incredible. Man, what a story. That's, that's amazing that, that you would go from almost uh, accidentally becoming a tour guide and then meeting yeah. the right people to writing on, you know, that's, that's just amazing. What an experience. Well, yeah, thanks. I think, you know, for me, when, when other people ask, you know, how do you do this, that, and the other? Because everyone has their own way into the business. And some sure. of them come from USC film school to the business, yeah. right? You right, know, that, yeah. that's a path. Uh, but for me, my path was very kind of like all over the place. Yeah. Uh, but what I tell everybody is whenever an opportunity presents itself to you, yeah. you have to take it. Yeah. Yeah. You have to embrace every opportunity that that comes your way. And some of those opportunities are strange, interesting opportunities that you may go, well, I'm not going to make a lot and it's going to be really difficult. And I know this is going to be a headache. You take it. Yeah. Because you never know where those things lead. The way that I ended up at Niantic was quite, again, by accident, I was working on a project for the government, helping them figure some, some stuff out. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of us came together into kind of a think tank. Mm -hmm. And one of the people that came into the think tank was one of the early people at Google, like employee number 40 or 50. So you can mm. kind of imagine what her 4 okay one. Her <laughs> yeah. Probably Doing pretty well. Pretty, pretty fucking impressive, right? Yeah. But anyway... Um, she ended up becoming an angel investor and investing in a lot of companies, Uber and everything else. So she does, oh, okay. she does quite well for herself. I was going to say, yeah, well, I, I think she's good. <laughs> right. But, but she was friends with John Hankey. Mm. And John Hankey was the man that sold the company Keyhole, which became right. Google Books and Google Maps. And he was, at the time, uh, the vice president of Google in charge of mapping. Mm. And John approached her one day and said, hey, you know, I'm thinking of starting, uh, doing a startup that we're going to start up inside of Google. Uh, do you know any Hollywood types? Do you know any like writer types or like creative types? And Megan went, yes. As a matter of fact, I know a few. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was one of them because wow. we spent a month together, you know, uh, eight years ago in a think tank. <laughs> and so she, she, you know, she put me in, she put me in touch with John and that's how I ended up at, at Niantic. So yeah, you never wow. know. Yeah you never know how these weird things are going to happen. Right. Yeah. And that opportunity also came about as a result of me being a good friends and collaborator with a guy named Flint Dilly. Mm -hmm. And Flint and I were in the same, uh, Flint and I were in the same think tank thing together, yeah. but Flint and I have worked together over a number yeah. of years on a number of projects, including mm -hmm. Chronicle of Riddick, including, uh, uh, you know, a, a number of big titles. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, and we also wrote a book on writing video games together. Which yeah. is, that, I was going to ask that question is how yeah. did you come together with Frank? Because that book, yeah. right, is kind of a number one seller for a long time within it's that category. Yeah, it's, it's still killing it still. <laughs> on Amazon, I don't know. But, yeah. uh, but that was literally uh, yeah. a, a blind date that a new <laughs> friend of ours set up. Yeah. You know, I was working with an engineer on a project who was also working with Flint. Uh -huh. and Flint and I had never met. And, uh, and this engineer who now uh, is, is a very interesting cat, works for a lot of big agencies now but uh said uh you know what you guys you guys are like brothers you know you guys have the same attitude you you yeah. think the same you you he goes you guys should get together yeah and i was like sure okay <laughs> and so he actually set us up on a blind date at the dinner date <laughs> flint and i met and we had dinner together and we realized yeah. that we kind of liked each other and we hit it off and yeah. uh, so we made a date to have another set of cigars like two months later. And then after that, <laughs> we started talking about things. And yeah. one thing led to another. And we realized we kind of synced up creatively. And yep. yeah, so we decided to write a few things together and see how it would go. And it turned out great. Sounds like it's turned out great. <laughs> yeah. And he remains a good, dear friend of mine to this day. You know, he's my yeah. brother from another mother. And, yeah. uh, and Flint has an amazing backstory that's, you know, take, take, take whatever you think about my backstory and multiply it by 10. Really? <laughs> That's a backstory because you know Flint worked on Transformers. He worked on GI Joe. He has oh, a, yeah. he has characters named after him in D and D because he worked directly with Gary Gygax. It's like you oh, just wow. get, you get into all of these stories and you just yeah. like ah, oh, you can't believe. <laughs> it. So yeah, that's um, awesome. Yeah, that's how we ended up uh, together and ended up writing the book together. Well, that that's pretty awesome. Well, that that kind of brings us to Saint Mercy. Yeah, which uh, I'm from what I saw is that your first forte into comics. It is. It is. Yep. Um, I've been. Where did that story come from? It's very unique, right? It's about yeah. this 
young girl who is a god who is being sacrificed for her people and then i mean it goes back and forth and then a couple hundred years later she's uh in a western i mean it's an amazing story and and the depth of the story right as you read it a couple times you, you realize that it's a lot deeper than that first read um and, and there's a lot of emotion involved in it and uh, a lot of history involved in it um, I, I really enjoyed it. And that came out, I believe, a, a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Right. So it's available. Saying. Yeah. Uh, St. Mercy is available now in trade paperback. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, you can pick it up at Amazon or mm -hmm. your local uh, comic book shop, or you can have it ordered, or, you know, I think Barnes & Noble has it too. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, the way St. Mercy came about was uh, I've been a longtime friend uh, with Matt Hawkins, who's basically... Uh, you know, the top dog with Mark Silvestri over at, at oh, okay. Top and Image. Yeah. And, uh, and Matt is a really amazing uh, comic book writer himself. In fact, he wrote uh, the comic book adaptation of a video game that I made called Fear Effect. Oh. And, uh, and so we've been talking over the years, yeah, let's do something at some point. And with, uh, with COVID happening, a lot of my video game stuff was being more uh, uh, remote. And so mm -hmm. I, I did, a, I, I had a lot more time than would have normally been travel time. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of time on my schedule and I thought, well, you know, maybe I can fit something else in. Yeah. And I've been thinking about the story of St. Mercy for a long time, basically because a few years back I had gotten very fascinated by the ritual sacrifice of children, mm. this process called the Capacocha. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd seen some photographs of like these children who had, uh, been sacrificed and were kind of like frozen mummified because they mm -hmm. were on the top part of the Andes. Yeah. Uh, and it was some really interesting, beautiful stuff. And I thought, well, you know, through a modern lens, we would think of that as horrible that you would yeah. actually, you know, be killing children. But what did the children think? Yeah. Through the lens of somebody who believed in the Incan gods. Yeah. And saw this as an amazing uh you know honor to be sacrificed to the gods what would they think and the more research and stuff i did on it the more i found out that these children were basically treated like rock stars for the equivalent of about a year they were yeah. brought up to the high temples uh at a time when food was tough to find sometimes mm -hmm. they were fed everything you could imagine uh they were treated like rock stars mm -hmm. and then you know there was just one small issue at the end is after that year they would right you know, dope them up as high as they could on coca leaves and then yeah. you know, sacrifice them. Yeah. And uh, and so that story just starts to really resonate with me. And I thought there's something here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I wanted to tell also a story of like I grew up in East Los Angeles in El Monte, which was a, at that time a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and so I knew a lot of these young teenage girls from Hispanic descent. And uh, I'd always wanted to tell a story that kind of honored their story in a way sure and i thought well maybe it's interesting if i kind of put these two together in some fascinating thing and i didn't want to tell it necessarily modern day because i wanted to have characters isolated and it's so hard to isolate a character today with all the ways that people can communicate with each other mm -hmm. and i thought well i love westerns let's just mix this together yeah now uh any smart person who's ever done a comic book would would have immediately told me I'm insane. Don't do this. This is stupid. <laughs> you know, you're nuts. Yeah. Uh, but when I talk with Matt Hawkins about it and my partner at Epity, Epitome, uh, Rich Leibowitz, when I talk with them about it, they both went, "This sounds cool. Let's do yeah. this." And <laughs> so a little about a, a little bit of my own, you know, naive, naivete kind of yeah. be, went into it. But I said, "Okay, I'm going to do what I do best. I'm just going to dive in and try and craft the most interesting story I could." And as I started to write the story, I also realized that there was a lot of interesting subtext about mm -hmm. the way society treats each other, the way society treats, uh, you know, uh, disenfranchised uh, communities, the way society sure. treats women, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the way uh, society makes peace with religion. And, and I thought, well, you know, there's a lot I can do here. Yeah. But first and foremost, I want to tell a really interesting horror story. Yeah. And so, and so what I tell everybody is it's kind of like, you know, you can take your pick of the story. It's either a really interesting Western or it's a really interesting <laughs> historical drama. Very true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. And, but it's, and it could be both. Yeah. But, 
point in time the demonic children show up yeah show up you know <laughs> all hell breaks all loose. hell breaks loose yeah so then it becomes you know kind of a grindhouse you know kind of over the top horror yeah. story um but I had such a, a blast writing it. I really yeah. fell in love with Mercy. And yeah. uh, we are going to do a series two of Mercy. So I'm working on that right now. Well, yeah. that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really exciting. Yeah. Well, and that, you know, and that sort of led to uh, me doing revolvers. Okay. So that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. yeah, I was very fortunate and lucky that that Matt and Mark and everybody at Top Cow has been super supportive yeah. of my work. And Rich at Epitome was like, yeah, let's do something else. And I was like, okay, let's go. I <laughs> so yeah so uh, revolvers is, is pretty complex i think as yes. a story um and there's a lot of strings you could pull in a lot of different directions right you have hampton who is this detective um and his personal life is probably not up to par with where most personal lives would like to be right Correct. so he, there's there's that going on right and then on the other side right he gets involved in it in something that he shouldn't and now he's dying, right? He's on the deathbed. Um, yeah. His best friend and his partner, Mike, turns out to maybe not be who we all thought he was. Like, right. I don't want to give it away. I, I really want people to go out yeah. and buy this because it's an incredible story. And as you get deeper into it in issue two and three, right, you start to see how things start to tie in and that there's... I mean, I don't know what issue four has to say, but it's um, uh, it's really unique. I mean, I, I really enjoy it. That's why I did a review and I'm like, this this has some legs, man. This is really cool. So yeah. I have to ask you, where where does uh where does Hampton come from? Like so, how do, how does Hampton come to be? Yeah, so Hampton basically starts in a number of realms. Okay. Uh, I was a big fan of like uh cop shows growing up. So, you know, uh, I grew up on like, you know, Mannix and the Rockford Files yeah. <laughs> and, and, and like those kind of like shows. Yeah. And I always had this interesting uh, take mm -hmm. that I wanted to do on a, on a cop like that. And then um, uh, Heat was also a big influence. Al Pacino's character in Heat was a big yeah. influence. Um, and, and I thought, well, let's make a cop who's fundamentally good being a cop yeah but fundamentally shitty at, at, at being a, a human being right yeah right and could i put those two together in a way that a guy would say no i don't want to go on the take and take money yeah but i'm willing to cheat on my wife exactly yeah where, and where those lines are drawn <laughs> yeah. and i thought okay this this could be an interesting cat and yeah. then i said okay but i'm going to make him pay for these sins yeah and how he pays for these sins uh will be dark and so when i first talked with uh with christian debari the artist mm -hmm. um christian turned out to be a big fan of 90s and 80s horror movies which i'm also a huge fan of <laughs> and he loved grindhouse and he loved yeah. kind of like clive barker and, yeah. and i said well okay well if we said this is kind of like clive barker meets john wick meets he <laughs> yeah that <laughs> what a combination <laughs> dude i'm already off and drawing <laughs> you know, we're yeah, going. Yeah. and uh and he brought so so much to the to the property when i was initially thinking of it i was thinking more of kind of like a a law and order kind of like set of characters right right and and he started showing me his early concepts and i said holy fuck this is rock and roll <laughs> yeah. he, had, he had actually turned it into something where it's like you know you know, Big Mike looks like he's part of a motorcycle gang. Yeah. <laughs> he's like this kind of gruff, you know, kind of like, you know, ex rocker slash, you know, roadie oh, yeah. type. And, no, and definitely the artwork is incredible. Yeah, I'll, I'll put you, something yeah. up on the screen, but this is incredible. But yeah, go ahead. I, I don't want to interrupt. Not, 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 Christian is unfucking believable. He's up so good. Yeah. Uh, but he also has a, a colorist named Simon Go, who is yeah. just a phenomenal. And then, uh, and then Troy, who does all the lettering yeah uh, is is terrific and troy is super patient with me because yeah. you know I, I i tend to write in ways that most comic book writers don't write i write yeah. in screenplay format so i write it as if it's a film or a tv show mm -hmm. and then after that i reconvert it into comic book format but that means that a lot of the times when i'm converting stuff into comic book format i'm taking a lot of text that would otherwise not have survived yeah. if it started in comic book format right uh, 
and having to reconfigure it. And so, you know, Troy looks at it and goes, okay, well, you can write all this stuff, but where the fuck am I supposed to put it on the page? Right? <laughs> There's going to be no images and, left. <laughs> right, right. You know, I'm going to cover up the entire drawing that, that Christian did here. Yeah. And, but, but Troy has been really great in helping me, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of uh, get to the essence of some parts of the story and, uh, and turned out to be really phenomenal at figuring out where to put all of my insane uh, you know, text. So, uh, so yeah, so that was, uh, that was a really fun process to go through. Yeah. And I went through him, we went through that in St. Mercy and now uh, in revolvers, but right. uh, yeah. And to your point about uh, revolvers being a little bit mysterious and maybe you got to go read it twice and figure it out. I really wanted to write a story that had both ambiguity and, uh, and also this, you know, I'm not going to spoon feed everything to you. You're yeah, going to yeah. have two and two together yourself. And hopefully by the time you get to the end of book four, you'll have put it all together. Yeah. Uh, I kind of yeah. sense that ending with three, like, okay, yeah. now things are starting to come together and kind of yeah. tell the backstory that wasn't necessarily told at the beginning, right? Right. Well, and, and what I wanted it to be was sort of book one and book two is all about Hampton reacting to a situation. Yeah, he's, exactly. Yeah. He's, he's in this situation where he's constantly forced to just react. Yeah. And then in book three, he starts to figure it out because he's a detective and he's starting yeah. to put two and two together and he's starting to understand where he finds himself. Yeah. So that by the time you get to the end of book three, Hampton has become more of a proactive character. Yeah. In book four, Hampton is a one man army yeah. taking vengeance on the situation. So nice. Yeah, you're gonna, well, I can't wait for the artwork on that one, man. Because <laughs> yeah. some of the artwork on here is is pretty incredible, right? right. So you got the, the yeah. storytelling and the artwork just brings it all alive. It almost yeah. becomes 3D as you're reading it. Yeah. And that that's really, again, that's a tribute to my collaborators. It's yeah, really, for sure. You know, it's really, uh, you know, I try and put as much as I can into the yeah. script, but you really need talented people to take those words and elevate them to the next level. And, yeah. you know, I was super, super fortunate that, you know, I had, I had Christian and I had Troy and I, I had Simon, but in addition to that, I also had the support of, you know, Rich and I had the support of Matt, you know, when Matt first read the book, he was like, uh, okay, let's do it. You know? And that was one of those things where it was like, you know, yeah. again, it was Matt, taking a chance it, yeah. you know and i've been also very fortunate that you know mark has looked at the book and you know put his blessing on it and uh you know this is something that top cow used to do top cow used to do these very intense over the top mm -hmm. you know, kind of uh horror books yeah um, and they sort of stepped away from it for a bit and uh this one sort of brings it back yeah, so for sure if you're a fan of uh 80s grindhouse horror and you're not squeamish yeah uh, <laughs> This key the to the book. second one by the way if you're not squeamish yeah this is the book for you <laughs> yeah that's awesome so what does this mean for jzp moving forward um do you see yourself doing more on the comic side yeah. as opposed to the video game is there a transition taking place I'm, now I'm, in your life where this is where you want to be yeah because i'm a bit of a moron i'm kind of taking the book <laughs> on and so uh i have three more books that i'm writing right now okay uh, more books, including uh, series two um, for St. Mercy. But I'm also working on uh, another original title uh, that I've just put the book one to bed on. Oh, wow. uh, and then I have another book that I've written for uh, a video game company. It hasn't been announced yet, but I've already okay. written books and it looks like we're going to do a series two on that. Oh, wow. Uh, and then in the video game space, I continue to work on various video games and projects. Um, I'm currently doing a really cool thing with a company out of Malaysia that will be announced soon. Okay. Uh, I continue to be involved with my friends at, at Frontier Developments. They're the company behind uh, Jurassic World okay. uh, Evolution. And uh, we continue to talk and do stuff. Um, so, yeah. And then in addition to that, I've also written uh, a, a couple of streaming series. One of them is currently sitting uh, over at Amazon. We'll see if something happens with it or not. Wow. And... Uh, yeah, so I just I just continue to try and bang stuff out as I can, but uh, but I've been very very fortunate in that uh, in the comic book space, uh, I consider myself extremely lucky because I didn't have to grind my way through the indie comic world to find myself mm -hmm. working for a fairly major comic book publisher. Oh, for uh, sure. But I feel I paid my dues in a lot of other areas. So absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so and just you know now. Um, Hopefully the people that are reading the comics are enjoying them. Um, and uh, so far the, the sales have been good. 
Um, you know, I'm not setting the world on fire, but that's okay because, you know, I'm relatively new to the space and I know it takes a while for people to find their favorites. And so, yeah, sure. uh, you know, I'm hope I'm hoping that I resonate with the people that, that are reading the books and that, you know, as I continue to push new material out, uh, uh, the base will grow. But, um, but also I'm, you know, I can, I consider myself a very fortunate and very, uh, lucky person in the sense that I get to do what I love doing. You know, I get to earn a living uh, doing something I'm passionate about. And very few people can say that. And so, yeah, yeah every day I wake up, I'm like, you know, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> ready, right. So, uh, yeah. So that's, that's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a privilege that yeah. not a lot of people get. And so I take it very seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Will um, some of your new um, writings, the the comics that you had mentioned that you're working on, will those be under Top Cow as well with Image? Yes. Or okay, so the yes. so Absolutely. we could look for those in the near future under. There's another uh, one coming that'll be an original coming from Top Cow. Uh, okay. Series two of Saint Mercy will come as well. Okay. Top Cow. We're already talking about doing a series two of Revolvers, um, and uh, yeah, so those will be Top Cow. And then the the uh, other comic uh, that I've written. Um, that'll be part of a release of a video game. Okay. Um, and so that's going to release digitally via the video game company. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. Well, that's amazing. Um, yeah, you've accomplished a lot over the last 30 years, and I'm, I'm glad that you're in the comic space. Um, I, I, I do believe um, the next, you know, five to 10 years will be owned by the indie space. Um, I think people want new stories. I, you can see behind me, I'm a huge Marvel and a huge DC yeah, fan. Yeah. Um, I love those characters. They'll always be a big part of my life. Um, but I also am excited about new stories that are maybe outside of the hero space, although I love heroes and that's where my passion's at. I also love picking up something like a revolver is where it's has, I mean, you could call it a hero, call it not. I think there's, like you said, he kind of tippy toes around the hero spot yeah. and he falls back to that that shitty life that you had talked about, but well, boy, after these you, new stories are amazing. After you read book four, you can tell me whether you think he's a hero or not. Okay. No, I look forward to that. That's awesome. Jesus. He definitely pushes the line. Does he? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I agree with you completely. I love people creating content. And the great thing about what's available today for people is that they can, you know, team up with somebody with some talent. Yeah. Um, and, and put, put out their own comics, put out their yeah. own stories. You know, uh, a lot of people are really, you know, uh, uh, going hardcore against, uh, you know, AI generated art. Yeah. But I think AI generated art can serve as a uh, storyboard sure. for a, uh, a book that yeah. can then be drawn by, uh, you know, a talented artist that we've either heard of, or maybe somebody we don't know of and yeah. we're going to find them. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the amount of, insane talent you can find you know scrolling around on art station or deviant art is yeah. is crazy yeah. and so yeah so if you have a passion to tell a story mm -hmm. uh, and you think you've got something there's nothing stopping you yeah it's a shame that that comiXology is going through what it's going through yeah i know other digital distributors out there or there are yeah yeah or you can uh, or or you can distribute it yourself via website or through a small run yeah uh, i have a friend who uh, uh, who uh, who does uh, comics based on sort of uh, uh, Mexo American uh, uh, you know uh, stories and mythologies, mm -hmm. and she writes cool you know Latina heroes. Yeah, and then, uh, does Kickstarters, raises money, and then yeah. gets her stuff published and goes and gets her stuff distributed via local comic shops. So yeah. you know, there's nothing. There's nothing really stopping you if it's something you want to do. Um, yeah. And uh, and I'm always excited when I read something that I yeah I expected. You know something yeah. something different, a unique voice, a new voice. Yeah. Um, Agree. Agree. In many ways, I'm I'm as much an insider as an outsider in the comic space. Yeah. Yeah. Just because I I deal with a lot of these huge franchises and sure have been writing for a number of years. So it's hard for me to feel like a rebel when I'm writing, you know, a billion dollar property. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of hard for me to put that tag on myself. Hey, look at me. I'm new. No, I'm yeah. not. No, you're not. But, you're definitely but, not. But yeah. I'm, uh, but I'm new to the space and I'm learning as much as I can about the space and I'm excited about it. I'm really excited by it. 
Yeah, no, I'm excited to see um, what else you come up with because, like I said, revolvers. When I saw that and I read that first issue, I'm like, "Holy cow, man! This is this is pretty badass." So I'm glad that uh, you're pushing through. I know issue four is coming here uh, fairly yeah, soon. Yeah, issue four will be out mid uh, February, I think. Uh, mid February, yeah. So if you need a need a lovely next day gift for somebody on your Valentine's Day there list, you and you <laughs> they're fans yeah. of horror. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say if they're fans of horror. Um, yeah. Agree, agree. So, JZP, how could um, people find out more about what you're up to, stay up to date with some of the projects that you're working on? Where should they go? Yeah, so um, there's a couple places. I tend okay. to post stuff that I'm working uh, on on my Facebook page when I can. Okay. Uh, I'm the only John Zora Platten in the world. So if you want to friend me on Facebook and uh, just uh, ping me uh, a message, say, hey, you know, I, I heard you on, on Tom's uh uh, uh, video cast, you know, on his vlog. And uh, I would love to, uh, uh, I'd love to keep track of what you're doing and I'll, I'll friend you. Uh, sure. And I'm happy to answer any questions I can answer that, that I can. Uh, people can find me on LinkedIn, same name. Yeah. Uh, on Instagram, I'm my middle name only, which is Zuer, Z-U-U-R. Um, and you can find me on Instagram, uh, uh, Top Cow does a really good job of tagging me with any, okay. any new material that comes out that they're pushing. So if Top Cow is talking about any of the books that I've written, I'll always be tagged so you can kind of see what's happening there. Um, and uh, I don't do as good a job as I should about keeping my my own uh, personal uh, website up to date, but it is aggressor.com, which is basically okay. just tells you so, sort of the stuff I'm working on. Uh, and uh, my video game stuff uh, with Epitome, we're making announcements and we're making more announcements in the next month or so. So um, yeah, just keep a look for my name and you'll see what I'm up to. That's awesome, JZP. Well, yeah. I want to be super respectful of your time. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on and I wish you all the best. I will obviously stay in close contact as I'm reading these. They're awesome. I love them and uh, can't wait to read more from you, my friend. Awesome, Tom. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's okay. great being and getting a chance to talk with you and, uh, you know, continued success with your channel and all the things you're doing. And uh, yeah, let's let's definitely keep in touch. And uh, appreciate that. When, when book four comes around, I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up. <laughs> you're the man. I appreciate yeah. you. Well, thank you, JZP. Appreciate your time and uh, hope you have a great week. Thanks, man. It's great. Talk talking. soon. All right. Thank you. Have a good one, man. You too. Bye bye.